have the access, we do not have the voice to speak. So you notice that many times when we are in these meetings, because we are civil society, we are observers. So when we find anything wrong in a regional or global policy making space, we can only just you know, send our reservations. We are not allowed to speak. We cannot participate in it. And we think that such restrictions then also um, has impact on our own fundamental right as women peace builders to be able to make input into this um, into these uh, uh, processes. And we do acknowledge that the UN um, in 1998 had a UN declaration on the right and responsibility of individuals and groups and organs of society to promote and protect universally recognized uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. And it's, you know, so, so for us as human rights defenders, we find our legitimacy within this framework, yet we find out that this freedom for us to be able to express ourselves in policies uh, is not being allowed. One is that a lot of the grassroots women's organizations do not have the capacity, they do not have the resources to be able to be in these spaces. Secondly, even when they have the resources, they might not even have visas to, to be in those spaces. Even when they have visas like we do, some restrictions like what we have now and now we have technology would also not enable them to participate because they don't have access to technology because states governments have not been able to provide you know what is needed you know for us simple simply to connect and be in this space so we are seeing that increasingly this form of you know our form of advocacy that we are doing in terms of what we do at local level at national level and at global level we see that the space is limiting us so we, we, we wanted to, to carry out this research to find out how has it been, not just for us, but for other you know, people, grassroots women's organizations, women's rights organizations, working at different levels. How has this impacted on their advocacy so that we understand how best we can you know, share this information with people who are in decision-making uh, uh, positions to be able to help us? Because we, we increasingly seeing that 20 years after 1325, we are still struggling to have all the pillars implemented. We are struggling to get women in decision-making positions. We are struggling to prevent violence. We are struggling to protect women from sexual and gender-based violence. Yet those voices of women that matter, women who have been affected by conflict, women who, have been, who are living in post-conflict situations, in refugee situations, in IDPs, are not able to engage with these processes to be able to share what their needs are and what their reflections are. So in the spirit of, uh, of UN Security Resolution 1325 that calls for the participation of women in conflict situations and in post-conflict situations, we are advocating for a, a, a freedom, you know, for, for space for them to be able to engage in policies that affect them at local, national, regional, and global levels. So it's on this note that we, we have carried out with this research and I'm very excited that it's a conversation that started between me and Anne when we question ourselves in terms of what have we been doing, how to what extent have we been able to enable the space for women to speak. And we find out that within our limits, there's, there's not so much we can do, but we've tried to push for this participation. But we believe that having a deeper understanding of what the issues are, then that would enable us even as we continue to push, push after 20 years. And I will just say that 20 years after 1325, and we cannot do things as usual. We need to change the way we are doing things. So um, I'm so excited and I really want to hear what Dr. Amon has to share with us. And I'm also excited that my sister Nadia has joined us from the African Union. And uh, she's a wonderful friend who has also opened the doors for us as civil society organizations. So we have some allies. Uh, so I'm also looking uh, forward to hearing in terms of you know, what she sees and what she could advise that we do as civil society as we move beyond 20 years of 1325. And I hand over to you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thanks. Thank you so much, Helen. And I think uh, this kickoff uh, will really give some energy to this meeting. Thank you so much. And one of the things that I really, really liked um, what you said about it, like it's not just about us, how do we actually get those involved that have less easy access to, for example, a meeting like this or to decision making spaces. And um, I think that's, that's something we constantly need to keep in mind and it's becoming a little bit harder and now we have to do everything digitally. And uh, that's maybe something we can also discuss later on in the Q&A. Um, 
I think everyone is extremely excited for this and thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Aman Niene. I really still hope I pronounce your name right. Uh, my colleague, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, a short introduction. Um, you are the assistant lecturer at the School for Women and Gender Studies. And um, you actually wrote a very interesting a thesis on space, on gender identity construction. Um, and you've also done a doctoral study of men in parliament, uh, really looking into gender power and privilege in politics. Um, you are teaching in gender mainstreaming, gender identities and processes of social construction. And um, I am really, really excited that you've joined us because these subjects, tackling patriarchy, looking into these power structures, um, together looking at how we can, you know, uh, improve this civic space. I'm very excited to learn from you. Um, I'm going to give you the floor. Uh, you have uh, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to give you a little signal five minutes before the end. Um, and I just want to say to everyone who is listening in, we have plenty of time at the end to also ask questions about the research and further discuss it. Um, but if you have any questions, please put them in the chat so we ensure we're not going to lose any really good insights and questions. Um, please, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, um, Anne, for that generous introduction and to Helen for laying the background of, of this research, looking at women's spaces, uh, looking at women's participation and women's voice and what it means in terms of uh, policy making around women, peace and security. Um, I saw you flash my presentation. I don't know whether you want to do that or I can share from my site. Uh, whichever way is easier, I will, I will do that. Can I share from my part? Uh, I'm not sure. Marina, can he share from his own part? Oh, okay. Um, so I. I, I will request that um, I will give you signals in terms of how the slides will be moving, but uh, that is the work we've been doing. We've been looking at um, shrinking space for women's rights organization, especially with regard to policy making on women, peace and security. And the biggest question we're asking really is to, to say that within these years of implementing the uh, UN Security Council uh, Resolution 1325, are the women there in spaces where decisions are made? Uh, do they speak? Are they given attention to? And we, we managed to interact with women peace builders across the continent, from West Africa to uh, North Africa, to the Horn of Africa, to the Great Lakes region. And then we had a conversation with um, women peace builders from Middle East and also from Nepal. Um, and um, we had a conversation in total of 17 women peace builders. And these uh, were both from English speaking, but also French speaking communities. Um, in our introduction, we note that um, Women peace, uh, women, peace and security has been a journey, a journey which is really founded into the 2000 UN Security Council Resolution 1325, um, which in some ways has created a, a sense of global acknowledgement that we need to look at women, women's voices, women's participation as, as we are doing um, peace building, uh, as, as we are considering peace building processes. One of the departments of UN um, uh, political and peace building uh, affairs department puts it categorically that inclusion and meaningful participation of women in conflict prevention. I really liked the, the, the wording of inclusion and meaningful participation. But this is very fundamental to the realization of women's rights. So this is not something that is that is a mistake. The you know, women, peace, and security agenda is not by mistake. It's not a coincidence of any nature. It's something that 
global actors in peace building have thought about and looked at the rationale of how women can contribute to sustainable, inclusive, and meaningful peace building. Um, and when we're looking at that history, we found a very interesting central role of women's rights organizations, both in the framing, but also in the passage and in the advocacy for implementation of 1325. Um, and because this literature, largely feminist literature, talks about 1325 having conceptual roots in the 1995 Beijing Platform for Action, particularly that chapter on women and armed conflicts. And then they identify a caucus of women organizations that were working behind the scenes and investing into providing information to the Security Council, um, preparing the Security Council to accept uh, this uh, uh, information around this resolution, but also building networks with governments um, in terms of preparing them of what this was about. In three years after the Beijing, we saw the UN uh, CSW convening a critical debate discussing the obstacles to the implementation of that chapter on women and armed conflict. And all this kind of strategic mapping behind the scenes engagement by the women's rights organization, along with other global actors, particularly the uh, UN Security Council, brought this resolution fundamental and transformative as it is on the platform. And since then we have seen efforts to localize the 1325 resolution. If you talk about the African Union, um, the, the African Union acknowledges that there is um, an increasing realization of gender equality as a norm into what the AU does at the regional level in terms of policy development, in terms of programs, but also institutional structures. And that is really exemplified particularly by the appointment of the um, special envoy, the office of the special envoy in charge of women, peace and security. But you also look at an increasing investment into development of national action plans that provide a roadmap on how to implement 1325. When you look at the national and the lower level, you find a whole array of women's rights organizations forming networks, national, regional, and global networks that are working towards the implementation of 1325. We noted that we are increasingly seeing an institutional and institutionalized architecture on women, peace, and security. And, and for feminism, this is a feminist mark, particularly into a historically patriarchal system of international peace and security. So to make such a mark at a national level, at the regional level and at the global level, it is not a mean achievement. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that was the focus of the study, which I have talked about uh, and which Helen has really highlighted exploring the possibilities of women peace builders in terms of whether they access, whether they participate and whether they influence decisions in policy making platforms. And those are the short questions that we're asking, taking stock of policy making uh, platforms, asking whether women are there and whether they participate and whether their views are taken seriously. One of the most important contexts we worked in is to reflect on COVID-19 and its possible impact on women's participation and voice. And this process brings forth also an action, a call for action, which rotates around rethinking and strengthening women's access and participation. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so we wanted to share with us findings, uh, which we call learning points, that came from uh, your participation. Um, and there was, 
Number one, we note that the people we talked to, women peace builders, pointed out a wider array of institutional and formal spaces for policy making. Beginning from the global level, the UN Security Council, the General Assembly, the working groups that are there, the technical departments, um, looking at the regional platforms. Um, at, at the beginning, we were looking at the global and regional, but then the peace builders told us that these platforms actually go as low as grassroots. We have national level platforms where critical decisions on peace building are made, where teams, uh, uh, peace building teams, uh, negotiation teams are framed, where norms around what peace means and how to achieve it are framed. Um, and also we noted uh, that the participants highlighted women's movement, the women's rights organizations and the civil society networks as a collective space for policy influence. Um, and, and they argued that this is a space where sensitization and awareness creation happens, but also where documentation of grassroots experiences in communities affected by war takes place. And so this is a space that we cannot take for granted. Uh, for instance, in West Africa, uh, one of the participants noted that as far as secretariat, they have worked alongside UN by strengthening the women's working group. So you get a working relationship between UN formal systems and the civil society groups, um, but also sharing these platforms at the UN, but also at African Union. Um, she talked about having li liaison offices with the UN for over 15 years and very active at the um, CSW platform. And in Libya, these women's rights movements were perceived as a collective force, which creates a level of focus on demands of the network, but also it, when you come together as a movement, as a network, it increases pressure on governments and non-state actors to deliver on peace building. But also that it is a tactic when you work as a movement, it gives you a space to negotiate certain possible attacks that would come to you as an individual peace builder or an individual organization advancing this women, peace and security agenda. Because basically this agenda is a transformative agenda. It's an agenda that seeks to bring women onto the table where they have not been, which seeks to bring issues which have not been part of the peace building process. So it is that transformative. And the argument was that when there's that corrective uh, movement, it negotiates any kind of attack that would have come to an individual activist or an organization. Next slide. Next slide. So we, we went on to um, women's presence. We were asking whether women were there and the slide that is before that, which you have um, uh, flagged off. When we asked that question, we were told actually, this is not a question of yes or no, women are there or they are participating. But this has been a journey. And that this journey has been largely about women gaining entry into an area where they have not been historically. And one of the key things that participants highlighted at the regional level is the, the appointment of the Office of Special Envoy a critical space in which women's participation in mediation teams, in peace talks across African countries has been uh, framed. In particular, you know, uh, participants identified His Excellency Diop having been critical in championing women's participation. For instance, uh, Manu River in West Africa as one of those incidents where women first ever signed on the peace agreements. In, in Nepal, 
um, the activists, women defenders, women's rights defenders noted that uh, COVID-19 brought an opportunity, a rare opportunity for them to tell the government that it was not on the right track. Issues of suicide were on, on the rise, domestic violence was on the rise. So the, the women peace builders picked up on this context as a foundation to tell the government, look, you are not doing things in the right direction. And one of the activists said that I'm very happy to share that at least we have been listened to by the government at this point. And for you to get a sense of a feminist activist with a transformative agenda being listened to by a government, given the history of resistance, this is a milestone in some ways. But in DLC, grassroots women activists also had their own view that uh, one of them noted that when it comes to policy making, I am a simple woman who works at the local level. I have never participated in those spaces where policies are made. However, we have a woman elected as a member of parliament who later became a president of the National Assembly. And when it comes to participation at regional and international level, it is these women who are invited to those platforms where policies are involved. What we saw is not the, the, the kind of hierarchy and detachment in that conversation, but rather the link between women in the, in the upper echelons of decision-making and women at the grassroots and how these feed into each other in terms of what issues need to go to that platform. But also how women have gained ascendance into political spaces and how that has enabled them to participate in policy making platforms, whether this is about peace making or conventional political participation. Um, I'm Next gonna slide. give you this five minute warning. <laughs> uh, and I think there's also a bit of a problem with the French translation. So I just wanna signal that to the translators that uh, uh, if you can please translate it also for French participants. Uh, thank you, please continue. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, and, and also in terms of women's presence and participation, um, we, we met quite a number of stories where almost all the women peace builders have had engagements at the global, but also at the regional platforms. We had a number of them invited into UN Security Council open, open debates on sexual violence, on youth peace and security. And one of these conversations was very interesting. One of the activists told us that um, they have space to speak, that actually these spaces where they have been invited at the UN Security Council have helped them to let the world understand what is going on in their communities. Um, and, and she noted we were just trying to give a message about our situation and what they, the UN Security Council should do. We have had the opportunity to speak in different forums, in different events. But the challenge they note is that things are not changing in our reality. They, the UN officials in attendance, often seem understanding they show sympathy, but they are actually not doing serious actions towards this. And these conversations brought out complexities in these spaces. The spaces exist, women are invited, they are able to speak out, but somehow their voice does not translate into action. It remains at that rhetorical level, global level. And sometimes it has been you know, reduced to some sort of ritual of people come and speak, and that does not adequately translate into action. Next slide, please. Next slide. So in, in, in some ways, we wanted to demonstrate how women's presence in these platforms and women's participation has sort of interfaced with 
operations of patriarchal power. You have institutional processes that made, have made women's experiences intelligible, that we can sit now and conceive that in whatever conflict that is going on, we need to speak about women's experiences, that we need to speak about women as actors, that there are legitimized conversations on women's rights, the right to access, to participate, and to influence. And that women are seen as intelligible, as capable of being understood beyond victimhood. That women are not seen as anymore as, as chattels that are planted along other properties in armed conflicts. That women activists have gained an opportunity to step out of the reach of power to do the prohibited like negotiating all these patriarchies at the family level, at the state level, religious institutions, cultural patriarchies, for feminists to, to bring this agenda and sustain it for this time, it has been stronger negotiation. And for demanding to be part of policymaking platforms and demanding accountable peace. <laughs> but we noted that when you register such historical and increasingly institutionalized agendas, having women as actors and having new and divergent interests brought on the table, policy making, in such a historically patriarchal context, the celebration needs to be cautious, that we need to keep the watch because these transformative successes often generate alternative forms of resistances that we need to watch almost every stage of our activism. Next slide, please. So in here we share experiences that participants were talking about as about the shrinking space of women's participation. That in 2020, we still have spaces which are exclusively male. And this was one of the dialogues that you know, was shared with us um, that happened in Libya and Morocco recently, September 2020. The pictures do not show as if we have women in attendance. So we have male only or male dominated UN special envoys. We have peace missions that are ex exclusively, exclusively male. And these spaces are not without effect. We had the UN Department on Political and Peace Building acknowledging that the numbers of women involved in formal peacemaking processes still remain low. We have peace missions where women's rights organizations have been excluded. Next slide, please. Uh, dear Dr. Uh, Amon, um, can I ask you to maybe move to some of your recommendations? Because I also still want to give some time for discussion. Is that okay, okay with you? Thank you. Okay. So in some ways, um, if, if I can give a quick summary in one minute of the, the forms of, of shrinking space. One, we noted a bureaucratic delays and inaction and storing of policy decisions, particularly at the global and regional level. We noted co-option and appropriation of feminist agendas within um, international peace and security agendas that are largely military oriented. We noted invisible delegitimization of women's voices. We have a lot of rhetoric and in action, and then regressive practice where women's rights activists are barred from communicating with international community and other actors. So on that note, we, we had a core of action focusing at the global and regional and national actors. One, to call upon the UN Security Council to urge member states to meaningfully implement, implement the 1325 on increased representation to emphasize representation 
of women in peace building processes. Um, and, and to call upon the UN Security Council to reconceptualize women's participation and representation as a right towards contributing to sustainable peace. And to urge member states to promote strategies that enable women to participate in elective political leadership. Because that way, you have a cadre of women in national structures that are able to participate in at the national level, but also regional level. The next step, next slide. The other call is largely towards the women's rights organizations. Looking internally on our operations and what we could do in order to build capacities of women's rights activists to keep engaging and keep the pressure on the policy making actors. And one of them is to establish or where it is existing to strengthen feminist models of mentorship. Uh, you know, designing mentorship programs that speak to diverse interests of women, e.g. young women, women with disabilities, racial, ethnic minorities, among other identities. The other is to build activism for peace building from below. That actually, you know, uh, grassroots activism creates a broader spectrum for women to participate and creates opportunities for women to uh, document experiences of women in armed conflicts. Um, in particular, we, we also had a call on strengthening women peace builders potential in leadership and development and decision-making structures. So one of them there, what we can emphasize is building capacities of women and equipping them to with the knowledge to discern and negotiate and to make appropriate actions because there was an acknowledgement that peace building is a very sensitive area that needs a lot of discernment. The other is on funding, particularly calling upon global and regional funding agencies to invest in meaningful implementation of 1325, but also invest in psychosocial self-care of women activists because that everyday work you do might erode your energies. And the last call is on a deliberate focus on a critical masculinity perspective in gender, in gender sensitive peace building programs. And this is largely training a cadre of, of men and women who are knowledgeable on understanding the normalized and harmful forms of masculine, masculine behaviors and how to challenge these. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that I'm speaking for a lot of others saying that this is extremely interesting. Uh, I already got a few questions in the chat. Um, this is just the beginning. These are some first results and in the coming weeks, uh, but I'm also looking at Helen um, because I don't know the precise timeline, this research will be published and everything will be shared so we can all use it uh, to our advantage. Do you have a little bit of a timeline already, Helen? Um, so, of course, we would have really loved this research to be out this month, uh, but hopefully, once we get some of the feedback and confirmation from some of the women who were interviewed, that their views have been adequately represented through this forum, uh, then I think in the next two, three weeks, we might be having a soft, a soft copy that will be shared online. Great. So anyone who is here, we will keep you informed. We have your email addresses and um, we'll make sure we share it. And um, I am already very excited about some of the conclusions uh, from the research, especially, but let's talk about it a little bit later. Um, but I'm also very curious to hear from Nadia on this, um, who is working for the African Union Peace and Security Department. Um, often we have the discussions in our work, does it really work? Is it really an added value that we bring activists to these spaces? And now we see coming from this research that there is actually an added value. And uh, for you, Nadia, um, you've listened to the presentation. Uh, you've already uh, seen the PowerPoint before. 
uh, what are some of your reflection on this? And um, as working in African Union, uh, how can we work together to improve this you know, situation that is unfortunately uh, limiting access for a lot of women worldwide? Um, do we still have Nadia in the room? <laughs> Just seeing if she's still here. Um, okay, we might have lost a connection with Nadia. Um, but, uh, okay, well then we'll just have to be a little bit creative. Uh, Birhi Bo, uh, are you maybe ready to... Uh, ah, Nadia, are you back now? I'm getting a message in the chat that you're back. Ah, yes, there you are. Um, did you hear my question or should I just repeat what I was just saying? She's connecting to the audio, I see. Okay, uh, Nadia, welcome back. Um, so I was just introducing you and asking you if you could maybe reflect a little bit on some of the recommendations and conclusions from the research uh, that was done, uh, especially from your experience in the African Union. Um, and I hope you will be able to, if your microphone is working, etc. I think Nadia might have some issues with her internet. Um, maybe you from, need to remind uh, her to unmute herself. Yes. Hmm. Uh, maybe for now, uh, Hibo, are you still in the room? <laughs> Just yes, me. yes, I am. <laughs> um, are you okay with maybe reflecting a little bit uh, on this from the Somalia perspective first? Is that okay with you? Yes, yes, I can uh, start. Okay, thank you so much, Ibo. I was actually enjoying uh, listening to Helen and uh, Professor Amos. Uh, and when I was seeing the photo of the negotiation happening in Morocco or Libya, I was actually seeing uh, similarity with what we see every day in Somalia. The difference is that uh, they are all men, but some are uh, also men from the international community. <laughs> we have Somali men discussing about peace and men from the international community. And one of the other things that I, I really liked of uh, Professor Amon uh, recommendation of the research was uh, uh, when he was uh, talking about uh, investing on uh, psychosocial support, et cetera. I think uh, uh, for a woman that came out still in a battle on the sexual offenses bill, I see this kind of fora and discussing with Helen and other women yesterday. I think it's uh, one of our first uh, uh, psychosocial support. I think only being in rooms like this uh, with women all, from all around the world is I think the first uh, step of giving us more energy on, uh, on the work we do. Uh, can you hear me well? Because I cannot see myself uh, very well. Yes. But we are seeing you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was saying um, I'm Hibo. Uh, I'm the policy unit director of uh, either women's development organization. And I'm uh, a, a very proud uh, focal point of the civil society uh, platform for peace building and state building. Uh, during COVID and all the fights uh, for the sexual offenses bill of the last four five months, I don't think we were going to survive if we were not having uh, the Anne, the Marina and Peter of the situation because uh, 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 what we were doing together was giving us that breathing time not to focus on only our problem because the world is out. We have a lot of uh, similarity with other people uh, having our same problem. I think having said that, uh, let me uh, do a, a bit of reflection on the, uh, the attempt to localize the implementation of the UN resolution 1325 in Somalia over the past 20 years, and whether these attempts have had any impact on the situation of women. 
uh, in terms of peace and security. I will also try to explore uh, the women peace and security from the lenses of uh, uh, sexual gender-based violence, human rights, COVID-19, pandemic, and the evolving of the Somali political climate. Um, our women, uh, uh, very resilient, uh, were uh, part of the greater involvement on, on issue when it comes to peace building, uh, conflict resolution for, for many years, even before the introduction of the uh, uh, resolution 1325. As a matter of fact, Somalia had one of the biggest representation of women uh, during the Beijing uh, platform. But uh, if I go back to the implementation, uh, this has been limping over the last 20 years. I will try to uh, uh, give you an example uh, going from the uh, point of view of the basic uh, pillars that are women participation at all levels of decision making, protection of women and girls from SGBV, prevention of violence against women, including establishing mechanism to persecute violators uh, of human rights and women's rights, consideration for gender during relief and recovery. And all these have not uh, been institutionalized. In the absence of uh, an action plan for this resolution, this basic uh, pillar are yet to be achieved in Somalia. Although a number of programs uh, uh, and initiatives uh, done by NGOs, CSOs, and uh, uh, the UN have uh, uh, started and they were implemented, um, there were much, uh, there were no impacts uh, whatsoever. Uh, and one of the other biggest problem is when we try to uh, make uh, the resolution 1325 uh, as a project, uh, that doesn't stick. Uh, I will give you a, a few example. Uh, I like to give uh, the examples on what we uh, do normally in, uh, in Somalia. We were part of uh, uh, a group of uh, civil society and some UN agencies that were, were uh, uh, doing some district reconciliation program while building the districts, uh, the state building at the local level. We achieved to have 50% of women councillors also because the position of uh, uh, district councillors is not a paid uh, position so that the, there are no many men that are fighting for the position. The project was a success. We had 50% uh, of women uh, there. But uh, when this is not anchored uh, uh, and firmly anchored or institutionalized, what will happen is that the project finished, we had a success, but we left uh, 10 women alone in a district that is at two kilometers from an area that is uh, in the hand of Al-Shabaab. Any minutes they can be targeted because the project was so uh, uh, used uh, in the media, a lot of visibility, we like visibility. We put their names and their faces there and the program finished. Uh, nothing was done, nothing was uh, done after. And I think this is, uh, uh, all our fault. Uh, we can be the civil society, uh, it can be the UN agency or the donors themselves. Um, I will go into uh, some of the, um, I will start with the peace uh, building efforts. In all the peace reconciliation uh, uh, that happened in Somalia from 2000, and we are talking about 20 years, women were on the front run. Uh, they were part of the negotiations. Actually, when the issue were becoming tough, they were the ones who were sent. But when it was the time to take decision, uh, uh, the photo that Professor Amos show, show you were uh, uh, the, the, the type of uh, uh, experience we had. Men were uh, taking over uh, with the witness of the international community most, uh, most of the time. I will go on the issue that is in my heart for the last uh, five months. Uh, it's the support of the SOB. Uh, the Sexual Offenses Bill was tabled in the parliament in 2018. Um, uh, um, and since then, uh, the parliament uh, have procedures. I don't know uh, in other countries, but normally you have, uh, it's tabled. Uh, the committee that deals with the uh, issue that is the Committee of Human Rights is being given. Uh, actually, the parliament will uh, give, uh, uh, the leadership of the parliament will give uh, uh, the bill to all the MPs, 
and then uh, and the committee will, of human rights will call for a first hearing. The minister will come and discussions are done. After that, uh, during the second reading and the third reading, the parliament can change, amend, approve and so on. All these did not happen. Uh, I insist on saying that uh, after June 2018, this was given to all the parliamentarians. That means we have two minutes. Okay. Um, this was given to all the parliamentarians. That means 275 uh, parliamentarians were uh, given this possibility. For the last uh, four months, what we have passed is a smear campaign by the leadership of the parliament that never allowed this bill to, to be tabled. In addition to that, another bill uh, that uh, was uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, the age of consent being nine, sometimes 10, uh, and so on was introduced. I may, with the help of uh, uh, some international organizations, uh, we managed to stop that uh, with the help of one woman. We have 81 women in the parliament and only one woman uh, uh, helped us in all this. I'm saying this because sometimes we, we go for quantity when we are talking about quota, women participation, and we don't think about the quality. And if we have a type of social contract with this type of women. We are changing our uh, strategy because from now on we will choose who we want there. We don't have still one person, one vote, but we have instituted uh, a fundraising with GoFundMe and we have an account. So far, 100 uh, women and men uh, from all around the world, Somalis, have uh, uh, approved uh, and they, they join our battle. Uh, and why they joined our battle. In all this uh, fight we were having, most of the civil society were divided. Also, some of the men allies were not pushing because we are in election mood. Uh, people don't want to put their uh, ideas there because they are afraid of being labeled. We were all uh, accused, death threat here and there. But one of the things that uh, will save will save us and will save the UN 1325 is that we really believe uh, in the principles that made 1325 to come. But we need after 20 years uh, to, change, to, to change something on, uh, on the type of uh, strategy we are doing. We need to have uh, a strong groups like our uh, group at regional level when we are talking about Africa, but at global level where issues, tokenism, ticking the box will finish. Who is uh, 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 the organization in charge, uh, the mother of 1325? We need to see it. Which organization within the UN is that? We need to have that and we need that. I, I see uh, UNICEF uh, colleagues and UNICEF uh, method of working. They try to mainstream children issue at every sector. This did not happen with 1325 because 1325 is done as a tick in the box so that the donors are okay with it. We need, I think all of us to start reflecting and this is one of the uh, amazing fora that will make us, uh, Anne is in New York, then let us see what Anne can move there. Helen is uh, in, in Uganda. What we see, what we, because what Professor Amos was saying, it's like seeing uh, myself in, in Somalia and he was talking about uh, women all around the world. We have uh, 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 discrimination coming from all around uh, sectors, where we are in the first world or the third world. We need to have uh, even uh, allocated funding. Uh, Somalia might start to have a national action plan. By the way, Somalia doesn't have a national action plan. They might start to have, what is our plan? What are we going to do as a civil society? How to encounter that? When this national action plan is done, uh, mainly governments uh, in this area of ours are not interested on in human rights issues. They might not, they might leave it. What is our strategy? Uh, are we looking at angles where uh, our groups uh, can, can move forward? I leave you with that because I see also that the time is not uh, on our side, but I'm ready to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia is back. Thank you so much, Ibo. And I think I think your words are, are also really, really um, relevant uh, for our discussion. 
Uh, and, and I think there's just one little question I wanted to ask you, because um, if we look at the research from, uh, from WIPC and Dr. Amman, um, you are currently, of course, working in Somalia. Have you seen anything over the past few uh, months or maybe last year that you see that there is this, the space is shrinking and that maybe the government is using the current worldwide developments to make things harder for women's rights activists? Of course, of course. Uh, an example is that in uh, the, the 2018 uh, SOB that we were battling, uh, some of us were threatened. The first day that we managed to uh, have allies, uh, actually, what I was, uh, uh, what I forgot is, uh, out of 81, we had one woman who supported, and one man, and together they managed to stop the 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 the, the bogus bill that was tabled instead of the real uh, 2018. But we had also an ally who was inside. Most of these uh, uh, parliament uh, uh, discussions are online. And that day we had uh, uh, the possibility to have the media as allies and the whole thing was uh, done online. And since uh, that day, uh, uh, journalists, uh, actually the leadership of the parliament threatened the journalist. Out of three, two sticked uh, with their principles and the whole thing was seen by the media. We had an amazing uh, uh, help from the youth, Somali youth. And those are some of the people that are really making all of us to go uh, and go on. They bashed on them, Twitter is, is there trying to, uh, uh, most of the problems we have, uh, people uh, like to, at least in Somalia, they like to listen what others are saying but they don't like to read. What this uh, young uh, generation of Somalis did was that they put the, uh, the sexual offenses bill, the Somali version, the English version for whoever wanted to see, but uh, the, the threat are so much that some of us, uh, we are saying shrinking the space because some of us were afraid even to help us. Some of us were afraid to be associated with us. Uh, uh, and uh, because we have elections, some of them might uh, think that they might have possibility to enter in the politics. Uh, that's why they didn't do anything. Uh, and I think uh, if we continue like this, we are going to have a big problem because only for the last four months, more than 30 uh, young uh, girls and boys were raped. We are in a situation where some regions like in the South, uh, two boys were raped two, three months ago, and uh, the community uh, went out and uh, the government of that uh, uh, area uh, executed the two men in two months. I'm not saying that uh, I support or I don't support, but you can't arrest somebody and execute him in two days. This is uh, something that is not, but it's like the law, everybody is taking the law on the hands. Uh, uh, two months before, before all this campaign started, a girl was raped and she was uh, thrown from a sixth floor. Uh, some MPs within the parliament uh, tried to free some of the men and two women who facilitated the whole thing, the whole rape. And they, when the people start talking, they were threatened. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we continue with this kind of atmosphere, if our leadership don't take a stand on this, I think we are going to be protected by the WWF, the panda, uh, <laughs> not only shrinking the space, uh, few of us will remain. And that's a real danger in Somalia. And okay. this will happen in the next three months. Thank you. Thank you, but I think this, um, we should really take this into account, I think also in the research. And um, I'm sorry to hear that, but unfortunately it's also uh, something that's not, um, only the case for Somalia. So let's let's hope um, we can keep on working on that with everyone who is here in the room. And thank you so much for your answer and your explanation. Um, so um, um, Nadia is ha not having very stable internet, um, talking about shrinking civic space. Uh, the internet in Addis is not always that reliable. And uh, I think we're seeing maybe a little bit <laughs> of an example of that. We are allowed to make that uh, joke. Um, so I think uh, there are a few questions. There will be two questions in the chat and I think 
Jolly, you put your hands up. Uh, would you maybe like to go first? And Nadia is back. So uh, we she's can, back. Yeah, if we can allow her to speak before her internet goes up. Yeah. Yes, sure, sure. If she's back. Yes. I don't, I don't think she's back, uh, Helen. I think the internet is still quite unstable, but we will keep an eye on her. Uh, my colleagues are monitoring the people who are coming in and out. So as soon as she's in, we'll give her the space. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Jolly, uh, would you like to ask your question? Um. Oui, mais je ne sais pas si ma connexion est bonne aussi, mais est-ce que vous me captez là? Um, can someone translate uh, from French to English, please? Uh, je vais écrire sur le chat alors. <laughs> yeah. So can someone please repeat the question because I couldn't hear it very well. My apologies. Oui, je disais la connexion elle est trop trop mauvaise. Je vais aller sur le chat. Um, okay, so I think we may have lost the translator for a second again. Um, Julie, uh, um, we will first go um, then to the other two questions and we'll get back to you if that's okay. Um, so there was a question from Rosie Stone about the Uganda People's Defense Force who oui, is conducting yeah. pre-deployment training for Somalia and STBV, which also deals with masculinity and conflict. Um, and this is a very interesting question. Um, why, uh, how widespread is this training for African Union troops? And why do they not tap into women's activist groups locally to improve, improve training for peacekeepers? Um, I'm not sure, uh, maybe you know a little bit more about this, Hibo? Come again, I lost you. Yes, no problem. Um, so it is about the, the pre-deployment training for Somalia, um, and they are receiving trainings on SGBV. And um, they were wondering um, why these trainings do not dive into women's activist groups. Um, and it might also be, um, uh, this also may be an interesting question for you, Helen, but maybe you have some experience with this, uh, Hibo. Um, if I talk about uh, my case, we need to understand what uh, 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 the Amisom troops that are in Somalia mandate is. Is it to defend uh, uh, the population or they are there only to protect the government because uh, when we have that uh, idea clear you will uh, understand i know that over the years especially at the beginning of uh, amisom uh, uh, when the amisom troops came to somalia and i think we are talking about 13 14 years uh, we we try to push some donors uh, 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 and and see uh, if uh, issues of uh, SGBV or human rights uh, issues are discussed. But so far, as far I'm concerned, none of us are involved. There is no uh, need uh, of involving us. And I don't think there is even interest from the international community that are supporting the troops to even do that. Uh, AMISOM is there, but is there uh, at the end, uh, is they are there for the people. But the people need to see that you are there for them. They need to see that when the troops are liberating the area, that uh, a, a, a peace is coming, the dividends of peace are coming, uh, human rights are protected. But none of this is done because uh, the swift of liberating areas and then going back uh, uh, and leaving the, the city immediately for Al-Shabaab to enter will not uh, allow even the people to voluntarily go and give them suggestion. I think so far, 
uh, and again, you connect this with 1325. Can that be in, uh, mainstreamed within the uh, forces? I think it's uh, uh, a work that uh, not only the civil society in Somalia, because sometimes you are so focused on the fight you're having that you don't see all these angles. I think uh, we were discussing with uh, Helen yesterday we need to have uh, a, a, a regional, a global thinking on this kind of uh, but, but, but practical. Uh, maybe starting with an audit of how things are done from looking at the 1325 lenses. And that role will need to be done by civil society. And I insist on that. No, and I think I think that's a very good point. You know, we want to make sure that 1325 is integrated in all the work we do. At the same time, not every women's rights organization wants to be associated um, uh, with uh, security forces. Um, I believe Nadia is back and um, she's having some issues with the internet. Uh, Nadia, would you still like to reflect on uh, the research? Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. And sorry, I had a technical problem. You know, my Wi-Fi at home is not so good. Uh, I, uh, when I looked at uh, uh, reflect, when I looked at uh, the, the study uh, in the uh, part, uh, can I speak French? Is it okay? Oui, c'est pas de problème. Nous avons de traduction. Pardon. Can I speak French? Okay. Oui, pas de problème. Okay. Donc, euh, euh, quand, euh, quand j'ai pris en, en, en compte l'étude la, 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 sur la réduction des espaces d'engagement, d'élaboration des politiques au niveau euh, mondial, régional et national pour les organisations des défenses des droits de l'homme, euh, des droits des femmes axés sur le programme Femmes, Paix et Sécurité, euh, j'ai trouvé d'abord que c'était une étude qui était opportune et qui était déterminante parce que c'est comme si on faisait un audit euh, de, 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 de ce qui de ce, de, de ce que euh, 20 ans après on, on a comme espace euh, pour euh, la société civile et euh, euh, c'était important que cette étude soit faite maintenant parce que quand vous le savez tous la résolution 1325 est, euh, est une résolution qui est née euh, de plusieurs décennies de militantisme euh, qui, qui, et qui a fait qu'on aboutit à cette idée qui est devenue une norme mondiale euh, qui, qui reconnaît que la paix n'est durable qu'avec la pleine inclusion des femmes et, euh, et qu'elle est indissociable des égal, de l'égalité des sexes. Euh, pour moi, c'est pour ça que j'étais euh, euh, très euh, intéressée par cette étude elle m'a permis de réfléchir et de poser la question qui suit. Est-ce qu'il s'agit vraiment d'un retrécissement au niveau régional Et je parle pour ce qui est de l'Union de africaine, parce que je connais l'Union africaine. Est-ce qu'il s'agit réellement d'un rétrécissement ou d'un des, des organisations de la société civile pour l'élaboration des, des politiques qui va impacter sur la mise en œuvre de la 1325 ou pour ce qui est de l'Union africaine, ou est-ce qu'il s'agit aussi d'une absence euh, de, de, de méconnaissance des, des, des mécanismes qui existent au sein de la Commission de l'Union africaine Et je reviens sur ce point. Pourquoi je dis ça Je dis quand je lis l'étude, elle était plus portée sur les mécanismes qui existent euh, à, aux Nations unies que sur les mécanismes qui existent au sein de la Commission de l'Union africaine. Euh, je pense que euh, la, la personne, le, le consultant, euh, a, a, a mis en exergue euh, certains espaces, tels que le Conseil de paix et de sécurité, l'envoyé spécial, euh, qui sont euh, des, 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 bien sûr des mécanismes pour euh, permettre l'accès la, euh, et, la et la participation euh, des femmes. Mais il a omis, euh, des, il a omis certains mécanismes qui sont tout au tout aussi important que ce qu'il a nommé. Et euh, par exemple, euh, certes, je, je suis d'accord avec, avec la, 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 le, le Conseil de paix et sécurité et, euh, et le fait que nous ayons maintenant trois sessions consacrées euh, au, au thème femmes, euh, paix et sécurité. 
qui sont euh, une qui est au mois de mars et une qui est au mois de euh, d'octobre et une qui sera euh, euh, bientôt euh, dédiée à, aux violences basées sur le genre en, dans les pays en conflit et, et euh, post conflit. Euh, donc ce que je disais c'est que il a omis par exemple les mécanismes tels que la formule de Livingstone euh, qui est aussi une formule qui permet aux organisations de, de, de la société civile de contribuer au, au, au rapport du Conseil de paix et sécurité qui est soumis au chef d'État, rapport sur l'état de la paix et de la sécurité en Afrique. Donc, euh, à travers la formule de Livingstone et à travers, euh, euh, on appelle la formule de Livingstone parce que ça, parce que ça a été euh, créé euh, au Zimbabwe à Livingstone, euh, à travers cette formule, à travers cette, ce mécanisme, les organisations de la société civile annuellement sont amenées à se rencontrer et à, à partager leur contribution sur une thématique qui peut être une thématique portant sur les femmes ou qui peut être une thématique portant sur un pays où on pourra mettre en exergue le, le, les conséquences euh, d'un conflit ou les conséquences d'un processus de paix sur les femmes. Euh, il, 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 il a aussi omis de parler de l'écosoc. L'écosoc, c'est l'organe euh, de la société civile euh, de, de, de l'Union africaine. Euh, c'est un organe qui est peut-être mal utilisé, même par nous, les gens de la commission, mais c'est un organe qui est conçu pour servir d'interface euh, dans l'élaboration des politiques. Euh, en mettant l'expertise de la société civile au service des travaux des différents départements de la Commission. Et, euh, et par ce biais, à, à l'ensemble de, de, de l'Union, et l'Union, il y a plusieurs organes. Euh, la fonction donc principale de, ce, de cet organe, elle n'est elle est pas moindre, c'est de contribuer par des conseils euh, à traduire effectivement les objectifs euh, et un programme concret, euh, les objectifs de, 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 et les politiques de l'Union africaine telles que euh, l'égalité des sexes qui est dans le préambule de l'acte constitutif ou, aussi, ou bien tout ce qui est en rapport avec le, 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 le protocole de Maputo, un programme concret. Euh, et comment il intervient Il intervient euh, euh, par le biais d'études commissionnées et euh, sur, sur, sur une question euh, et qui, qui, qui va permettre de soumettre des recommandations aux organes politiques de l'Union africaine et aux plus hauts organes de, politiques de l'Union africaine, c'est-à-dire les chefs d'État euh, de l'Union africaine. Euh, donc, c'est quelque chose que peut-être qu on, on ne pense pas à utiliser et le, mon programme, le programme Genre Pays Sécurité du, du département Pays Sécurité, a cette année commissionné une étude, a mis en place, par exemple, un, 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 un groupe consultatif qui est composé de huit organisations de la société civile. Et je peux vous dire que euh, je connais Hélène dans ce groupe, Hélène fait partie de ce groupe, mais les autres membres, je ne les ai jamais connus, je n'ai jamais entendu parler. Donc, c'était ouvert à toute la société civile. L'essentiel, c'était qu'elle qu travaille sur les questions de femmes, paix et sécurité. Donc, on a commissionné pour la première fois euh, un avis consultatif sur la mise en œuvre euh, de, la, de, de la résolution 1325 en Afrique et pour avoir des... Des, des contributions, des recommandations euh, orientées euh, et plus euh Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've lost, uh, lost Nadia again. Um, that's a shame, but I think she, she shared some very interesting insights. Um, uh, Well, let's, <laughs> let's hope we'll find another way to continue discussion that is good on point. Um, one of the comments that was in the chat uh, from Vincent Camanero, which is also extremely interesting. Um, Pardon. Ah, you're back, Nadia. Ah, je suis de retour, excusez-moi. <laughs> I'm back. So sorry. S'il vous plaît, continuez. I'm so sorry. 
je vais essayer de faire vite pour pas que l'Internet soit coupé encore une fois. Ce que je disais, c'est que euh, l'étude a omis certains, certains mécanismes. Et ça, je pense que c'est aussi la faute, quelque part, de notre commission ou la faute de l'Union africaine. On crée beaucoup de choses, mais on ne sait pas euh, faire la publicité sur ce qu'on a. Et euh, donc, ces mécanismes tels que, tels que les COSOC, tels que les groupes consultatifs, sont à utiliser. On est en train de faire, aujourd'hui, j'étais dans une consultation régionale, avec les, avec, la, la, avec les membres de la société civile de la région centra, centrale, de, de l'Afrique la, centrale de, de l'Afrique. Et, et, et euh, demain, on fait avec l'Afrique du Nord. Vendredi, on fait Afrique, avec l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, lundi, on fait avec l'Afrique australe. Euh, C'est-à-dire qu'on a besoin de, de vraiment institutionnaliser ces mécanismes qui existent et de les utiliser. Le, le rapport parle beaucoup de, de ce qui se passe aux Nations Unies. Euh, oui, c'est bien, c'est l'organisation, euh, peut-être qu'on peut, peut l'appeler mère, mais euh, pour moi, euh, l'organisation continentale, l'organisation de l'Union africaine est très importante parce qu'elle sert de levier. Parce que quand on parle de mettre en œuvre l'agenda paix et sécurité, en Afrique, quand on est des organisations de la société civile en Afrique, on doit utiliser la maison mère, la maison, euh, la, 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 notre, notre maison, l'Union africaine, pour s'adresser à nos chefs d'État, pour, pour faire ou pour, pour faire en sorte que euh, euh, nous sommes présents lors des, des, des conseils de pays de sécurité. On a trois sessions maintenant. Mais comment utiliser ces sessions Hélène a participé à une session que nous avions faite sur les femmes euh, euh, du Soudan. Nous avons amené un groupe de 20 femmes du Soudan, des organisations de la société civile de différents bords, euh, pour euh, s'adresser au Conseil de pays de sécurité. Et euh, je peux vous dire qu'on n'a pas participé à, à l'écriture de leurs recommandations. On n'est on a, on a, on a pas, pas venu nous, membres de, de la commission, nous, staff de la commission, nous ne sommes pas assis avec elles pour finaliser leur, leur communiqué qu'elles allaient présenter aux, aux, aux États membres, au Conseil de paix et sécurité. Donc, il n'y avait pas de censure, c'est ce que je lisais dans le rapport par rapport à ce qui se passe aux Nations unies, lorsqu'on a des organisations qui s'adressent au Conseil de paix et de sécurité. Nous, on n'a on, on on, on pas euh, l'objectif de censurer ou on n'a pas l'objectif d'empêcher de, 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 de limiter euh, l'accès au Conseil de paix et sécurité en limitant la parole ou en formatant le, le communiqué. Non, euh, on, on veut vraiment que les contributions, les expertises et l'expérience nous aident à mieux euh, euh, mettre en œuvre cette résolution nous aide, nous aide mieux à informer, à, 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 comment à, à mettre en place nos politiques euh, plus, euh, plus euh, orientées vers les besoins réels euh, de, 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 des pays en crise ou en, en, en post-conflit. Donc, je, pour nous, euh, l'Union africaine n'est peut-être pas bien connu parce que l'étude montre que bon on s'est arrêté à l'envoyé spécial qui a un rôle très important mais euh, ou bien au conseil de paix et sécurité c'est très important bien sûr mais il y a d'autres mécanismes qu'il faut utiliser comme même le programme gender peace, gender peace and security ça a été créé en 2014 et l'objectif de ce programme c'est vraiment de collaborer avec les organisations de la société civile Hélène peut en parler aujourd'hui quand on fait nos, nos consultations euh, euh, régionales, euh, on demande aux organisations de la société civile d'inviter leur participation. On n'a pas droit de regard sur les listes des participants. On, on souhaite vraiment qu euh, de, que, que le processus soit inclusif et, euh, et, et, et nous espérons que de pouvoir, dans, dans le futur, institutionnaliser, parce que c'est ce qu'il faut, il faut vraiment institutionnaliser ces rencontres annuelles euh, parce que ce n'est pas suffisant d'avoir des rencontres annuelles. Il faut plutôt euh, faire en sorte qu'il y a un retour d'information. J'ai bien aimé l'histoire de l'audit. Il y a un retour d'information euh, entre euh, 
euh, l'organe, par exemple, quand, on, quand les, les, les organisations de la société civile s'adressent au Conseil de paix et sécurité, qu'il y ait un retour d'information et aussi euh, euh, un, un, une histoire de, de faire en sorte de rendre compte qu'est-ce qui a été fait. Vous avez présenté des recommandations, qu'est-ce qui a été fait après ça Donc, euh, malheureusement, et peut-être c'est une des choses que j'aimerais que qu'on qu qu discute, qu'on explore, c'est aussi de mettre en place des groupes de travail de femmes, euh, des, des, des organisations de la société civile auprès de ce Conseil de paix et sécurité euh, pour permettre à, 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 d'apporter pas seulement sur les questions euh, de la 1325 ou les questions de, de femmes pays sécurité, mais sur toutes les questions liées au, au conflit en Afrique et d'apporter, de faire en sorte que ce soit intégré dans les décisions du Conseil de paix et sécurité, pas seulement dans les décisions qui sont en rapport avec les, les, les trois euh, sessions euh, annuelles euh, en, en rapport avec l'agenda le, le, femmes pays sécurité. Voilà, à brièvement c'est ce que je voulais dire, mais j'avais d'autres choses à dire, mais j'ai peur d'être coupée. <rire> oh oui, je sais, je sais. Et je couvris, mais, et, et c'est très intéressant, mais nous avons seulement cinq minutes. Et euh, merci, merci beaucoup, Nadia. Et je pense que c'est très intéressant et j'espère dans la future, il y a beaucoup d'opportunités pour euh, travailler ensemble à ce sujet, parce que je pense oui. que les unions africaines, c'est très important pour pour faciliter euh, des coopérations et aussi pour faciliter des échanges euh, avec beaucoup des autres pays. Merci beaucoup Nadia et je m'excuse pour le pour le couper Merci. etc. Euh, ok. Euh, il y a des autres questions dans le uh, chat. Oh, I'm, I'm speaking French. Maybe it's easier if I speak English now. Um, so there was actually a very good comment in the chat. Um, uh, from Vincent Camanero, um, that we really need to look at positive masculinities. And I think this was also brought up by some of the other actors. Um, and, um, you know, we need men as actors of change. And I think that also came back a little bit in the research. So I just wanted to share that. And then there is, uh, I think, a very good closing question from Julie from the DRC. And um, she starts by saying that she believes in synergies between women beyond borders. And I think uh, everyone who is here uh, in this meeting believes that as well. You know, we can only actually um, improve the situation and for women's rights, for gender equality, if we work together. Um, and she has a very interesting question about um, how we can strengthen women's presence in UN peacekeeping missions. For example, um, she's referring to the fact that in the DRC, Congolese women are not represented within MUNISCO. Uh, MUNISCO. Um, uh, Dr. Amon, um, if I can ask that question to you, is there any recommendation from your research that you can give? And I'm just going to ask you to keep it short because I mean, we've already been asking an hour and a half from a lot of people. And then uh, uh, if you can answer that question, then we're going to wrap up this uh, session. Is that okay with you? Yes, please, can you uh, ask the question? No problem. So um, how can we actually uh, strengthen women's presence in uh, peacekeeping missions? For example, in the MUNISCO mission in DRC, but this is the same, of course, for UNMIS in South Sudan, for MUNISCA in Central African Republic, because uh, as Julie is saying, um, women are not properly represented and that leads to, in her words, uh, catastrophic consequences. Um, thank you so much. I think um, such a question needs to be uh, flagged uh, to the, especially the AU, as Nadia elaborated, on very many frameworks that speak about women's representation, participation, and those you know, platforms that she elaborated. But one of the things she talked about is that, yes, we develop many things, but we hardly implement this. And, and I think they, they, there's a lot of legal provision uh, that gives us the right to be there, but somehow, 
these are not communicated across the civil society organizations that should be having representation there. So I think we need to turn back to the AU Security Council uh, with the assistance of, of people that are in our networks. You have, you've had people at the AU to really raise the question of meaningful participation of women, but also that we can, as, as women's rights movement, we can push for women's participation in political, in politics at different levels, because sometimes how these groups are constituted, they, they pick up leadership from this institution, leadership from that government structure. And, and because most of these are male dominated, you have male dominated peace teams. So the, the building peace from below was arguing that is it possible to create a cadre of women leaders in politics? in that way to open opportunities and space where we can pick up women leaders from other structures to be on these mediation teams and peace talks. Thank you so much uh, for this answer. And uh, it's precisely 4.30, <laughs> so excellent timing. Um, I think we're all very excited to look into the research, to read all the interviews and all the reflections and to really learn from it. And I hope that, that not, this session is a stepping point for maybe more sessions when we uh, can dive more into it and also see how we as women's rights activists working all over the world can work together to address this issue even more. So I'm really excited about that. Um, thank you so much all our speakers, dear Hibo, dear Helen, dear Nadia, uh, dear Dr. Amon, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really appreciate your efforts in these challenging circumstances. Um, I would also like the opportunity to announce, hi Eva. <laughs> I also like the opportunity to announce uh, uh, an event we have tomorrow. Um, as you know, this is a series, so today was the second event. Uh, and tomorrow uh, at three o'clock again, NL time, but four o'clock uh, Kampala and Kenya time, we will have a session on uh, the WIMPI security agenda and political participation. Challenges and best practices from Burundi, Central African Republic, Central African Republic, and Guinea-Bissau, and we really will be reflecting on elections and how this has impacted uh, how women's security is relevant for this. So um, please join us for that session as well, also with some amazing speakers. Again, it will be available both in French and English, even though sometimes we have a bit of a challenge with the, <laughs> the translation, but uh, I think we got there most of the time. Um, thank you all for participating and I look forward to meeting you either digitally or hopefully in real life uh, soon. Thank you so much and have a really, really good afternoon and or evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.